Okay, then I welcome you to our talk about pains and gains of Kubernetes for developers. Let's start with a short question. Uh, raise your hand if you're currently working with Kubernetes, if you deploy stuff on there. Uh huh. Keep it raised, it's a bit hard against the bright light to see it. Okay, so that's uh, a lot of you. Okay, then second question. Who of you is using or has been using uh, a platform as a service, something like Cloud Foundry or Heroku? Also show your hand. Okay, that's a bit less. Very good. So our talk is about these topics. It's about platform as a service. It's about Kubernetes, how we can improve the developer experience and our experience we had in the past uh, about six, seven years uh, with these topics. Let me shortly introduce myself. My name is Adrian Kurt. I am a product owner for uh, the Swisscom Cloud. I'm uh, especially kind of responsible for things like MongoDB and Elasticsearch, so database services within cloud. And you see that Christiane is, was unable to join. Sadly, she got sick, but I got an awesome replacement. Thank you very much for stepping in. Hi, so my name is Bogdan Krisescu. I'm a cloud services engineer, mostly focused on messaging platforms. Perfect. So today we will show you two use cases we have internally for Kubernetes. It's not going to be the typical use case, it's going to be the bit more interesting use cases. Uh, we will talk a bit about the problems we faced and uh, the proposal we have uh, for a solution to these problems. But let's take a step back. What are we doing at Swisscom? I'm pretty sure you've all known or kind of even used Swisscom as telephone provider. I, I hope a lot of you have mobile contracts with us. If not, there's now the, the time to do that. No, just kidding. Uh, we're actually also a larger, rather large um, IT provider. And we, especially in cloud area, also provide private cloud services. And we have kind of two types of, of customers in that area. So it's small and medium enterprises, as well as large enterprises. These both have a bit different kind of requirements and therefore we separate them. We provide to them infrastructure as a service, as you would expect, so classical virtual machines. We have container as a service in the middle and platform as a service. Obviously the container as a service case is based on Kubernetes and uh, the platform as a service, as I mentioned before, that's a Cloud Foundry based platform. Uh, next to these services, we actually also provide additional things. So we provide stuff on our own infrastructure uh, in Swisscom data centers located in Switzerland, operated within Switzerland. Uh, but we also have a variety of services on top of AWS and Azure that we provide to our customers. With that introduction, let's go to our first use case. So in application cloud, that's what we call our platform as a service we actually have database services. That's, as you might remember, what I'm responsible for. Uh, we have a couple of them, so MongoDB, Redis, RabbitMQ, MariaDB, and Elasticsearch are currently our set. And for these, we need some kind of platform to host on top of them. Um, we do have these based on virtual machines. It's usually the case where it's a bit larger in terms of database size. And there was often the requirements from our clients to de have these also in, in small size, kind of for development purposes, easy throwaway instances, but also for smaller applications that don't need kind of these really heavy IO things that you would have on virtual machines. So we simply started with the Kubernetes. We do that based on best practices. We have three zones in three data centers. We deploy a couple of API nodes, a couple of worker nodes, and then it's rather simple. You deploy uh, MongoDB, for example, here on top. Uh, in MongoDB, the HI set is called the replica set. You link them together, and uh, on the bottom you see we have our 12-factor platform. It's the Cloud Foundry platform as a service. We have application cloud. Um, we then simply expose these database services and um, consume them from an external platform. That external access is actually something which is sometimes a bit tricky. So if you have like two separated platforms, you cannot easily share the network overlay and um, some of the database services are a bit tricky. The cool thing with Kubernetes is then we can actually deploy more of these MongoDBs. We can also deploy some other stuff. So for example, Redis. So based on this system, uh, we have uh, been 
serving uh, database services for quite a long time. So we launched that based on that platform in uh, 2017. So you might remember that's quite the early days of Kubernetes, actually. Well, back then, we built our own Kubernetes distribution <coughs> uh, based on upstream. And it was quite nice. So we had clusters that had over 300 worker nodes. Not sure if you've seen sizes or clusters with that size. Uh, we had multiple thousands on, of pods on top. And uh, with these things, there's also a bit scalability problems. So we uh, had a couple of learnings based on that. Uh, one of them is that our own Kubernetes distribution is actually not that cool or, well, it was good, but it's kind of, it adds no value. It's a lot of engineering to kind of engineer all the upgrade cycles and all these things. Uh, but you can easily just use one of the existing distributions there. Uh, we had scaling problems, so uh, one of the things was we had a couple of scripts that maintained these pods, these uh, connections in between. Uh, once you reach like a couple thousands of pods, um, these can cause problems. One we faced is actually we had like a script that requested DNS entries every second. If you do that by 3,000 pods or something like that, it's quite a lot of requests, and you need to handle that on your DNS, so it's not really perfect. And one of the things that we kind of derive from that is we should distribute the work uh, across multiple clusters instead of having these huge clusters. Let's head over to a second case. So thank you very much. So I will present our second use case, the log exposure service. So as you recall, Adrian mentioned, we also have our private cloud. And we, we came to the issue that we need to present to make uh, easy for our customers to access the logs of their workloads. The solution had to scale also with the amount of logs that their workload was generating. So at the moment, our workload is generating around 100,000 events per second. Okay, so this looked like a simple solution. We just need to use Kubernetes and then on top, Using streams, we can deploy Kafka and Apache Zookeeper. And then our cloud services can push the logs from the workload inside Kafka, and then the customer can have access to the logs just by connecting to, to Kafka. But this solution has to be turned into a service that then can be accessed by, by the customer. So this will be the journey of building such a service. So first of all is the infrastructure. As already mentioned, we are using Kubernetes. And for that, we use the managed Kubernetes service from our colleagues. And this allows us to easily scale and also easily, uh, easily automate all our operational tasks. Then for, for the data streaming, as mentioned, we decided to use Apache Kafka and Zookeeper. Apache Kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform which is very well suited for high volumes of data. Then we also want to operate as much as possible from all the day one and day two actions on our Kafka cluster. So we went to, to StreamZ. And StreamZ is an op it's a Kubernetes operator, which besides deploying your Kafka clusters, it's also taking care of, of uh, managing your users, your topics, your certificates. And in the end, it also does the uh, upgrades of Kafka and Zookeeper. Good, so now we had our data streaming in place. Now we had to think about business logic and making the user experience much more easier for our customers. Customers being our end customer or being our cloud services, which were pushing events into our data streaming solution. So for that, for that we had to code, basically Golang applications, custom development and expose APIs to the most important functionalities of our service. In the end, we had uh, Kubernetes applications, which we've packaged them using, using Helm. Good, so this part was done. Now, one step further, let's focus on automating the development process. And for that, we noticed that all our code or all our, uh, all our uh, files were stored in GitLab. So we decided, OK, let's use also GitLab as our CI CD tool. So we've built pipelines in GitLab to do all our continuous integration, to, to build, to test, to create artifacts, to do continuous scanning of our applications for security flows and code quality. 
And since we are there, we also created pipelines to, to deploy our platforms to different stages. Good. So now it's starting to look like a service, but we are still not there. As you see, our platform footprint, our, our service footprint started to grow, and we had to introduce a couple of more infrastructure tools. So let's have a look. So now we had all these microservices that we've created with our custom Go applications, and we secured the communication between them with MTLS. But now we had a lot of certificates, so we decided to, to use Cert Manager and for, for managing all our certificates in the Kubernetes cluster. And then we also had to introduce tooling for DNS updating and creating and so far, and using also uh, Nginx ingress controller for all our traffic. Good, so now we had all the components needed for the customer to be able to access our service and have uh, and consume his uh, his logs but from a service point of view we are still not production ready there are two more things which are missing one of them being monitoring so of course our service has an sla which we have agreed with our customer we need monitoring tooling in place in order to be able that we deliver what we have promised to our customers so we've deployed the Prometheus operator on all our Kubernetes clusters, and then our engineers had access to metrics, to dashboard, to alerts about the workload in the Kubernetes cluster. And then they took it even further and created SLIs and SLOs for the service. Regarding the, the logging of the application, we decided to forward everything to an L stack. So now all our engineers had a clear view of what's going on on the application in any, any point of time. And then, all the automated notifications are being sent to Ofgini, which will notify our on-call engineer in case something is going wrong. So yes, we have monitoring in place. Now we know if something is going bad, but in case from being notified about a disaster till fixing the disaster is still a big way to go. So the last, the last piece that is missing is backup and restore. And for that, we decided to, to install on our cluster Valero. Valero is doing a backup of all our Kubernetes resource objects into S3. And we still had one piece missing. That would have been the data of our customers. We decided to use Kafka Connect to stream all our data in Kafka into S3 as well. And then with a custom application that we have developed, we are able to restore the data of all of our customers or just a subset of them. Good, and our service is, has been built. As you can see, it has been quite a journey. So we started with the idea, yes, we need Kubernetes, we need Kafka, we need StreamZ, and we have our solution. But in the end, until this was being presented to the customer, we had to research, install, and in the end operate a lot of other components to make the service ready. And yeah, this is kind of the, the thing with, with Kubernetes. If perhaps you know it already, but who doesn't know it, maybe have a quick glance at it. In the end, Kubernetes is not this magic unicorn which is going to fix all your problems. Just move your application to Kubernetes and then the problems are solved. No, Kubernetes basically provides you a framework to build a platform which is suited for the workload that you are going to run on top of it. And with that comes the problems with Kubernetes. So it's the problem's complexity. So Kubernetes has a high barrier of entry for our developers. A lot of the building blocks of for, for a service are not present on an, on an empty Kubernetes cluster. When you order things, it's just empty, nothing is there. Every team that wants to, to deploy, to build a service, build an application on a new Kubernetes cluster has to rethink, redesign, rework this platform stack which, on which it, uh, the application is going to sit on. So you've heard me mentioning platform, platform, platform. And Adrian also mentioned Cloud Foundry, this platform as a service. And from Cloud Foundry, what we really liked, it was the experience to deploy your application. You didn't need a lot of things. You needed your source code. You needed one manifest in which you described in a few lines of YAML, hey, this is my app, these are the specs for, for my requirements. 
and you're pretty much done. Then you go to the CLI and just run CF push. And then you just hand over this, this bunch of files to, to Cloud Foundry and it would build up the, the app and the app would just be up and available to use. So this is something that we would like to have this experience, we would also like to have in Kubernetes. And this is something that we are working on right now. We would like to have a platform on top of Kubernetes that is meant for developers and makes the life of developer easy. The developer should just think about his task, his, what he needs to build, and not about the components of the underneath platform. So that basically already concludes our talk. We've shown you how we uh, managed or kind of we are working on that transition from that rather big mess of tooling to a more structured and kind of unified experience. Um, it adds a bit of more uh, developer focused toolings as well uh, because it's not that specific use case, but that's currently what we're working on. And um, I would like to hear from you guys as well. So please come at, your, at our booth downstairs, um, Come talk with us, talk about what your experience are, what your problems are with Kubernetes, where you think, hey, this, this is the big thing to solve. Then we can a bit share, hey, what we are currently doing, uh, in maybe a bit more detail as well. And uh, with that, I would also open the floor to questions. Thank you for the presentation so far. Uh, so you mentioned you're in that transition from this on-streamlined, a bit chaotic towards this centralized stack. How far are you in that journey and what are maybe the, the impediments on that journey? That's a really good question. So it's, it's a, a big step to do something, especially in a large company like Swisscom. Um, we, we are lucky we have a, a good base we can build on, which is um, quite heavily used within the company. And on top of that base, we are now trying to extend especially the developer experience so that we kind of have that platform as a service uh, layer. Um, it's a work in progress, so we're developing that. We are currently in the state where we are testing this with um, internal customers as well as also external customers, uh, where we kind of show them, hey, this is our experience or our idea of the future. This is how it feels. So it, it works. It's it's like it's life. It's op using uh, open source tooling actually, and um, we're gathering feedback there and see how we can kind of bring that to a standard that's used within Swisscom, but also across other companies in the future. Cool thing is also it's uh, platform independent, or at least it's meant to be platform independent in the target solution. So we're also working on transitioning our internal workload to AWS. And um, that's also something we can target easily and kind of add there the platform as a service experience on their Kubernetes. I hope that answers the question. Are there more questions? One last question. Okay, then thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven.